Today I've decided to answer a question that literally nobody has Okay, asked. okay. That was a that good one. So, today is a special Oh yeah! Day. It's been just about a year since I originally recorded my DMC5 No Weapons run. With that in mind, I decided to answer this question. What's the point of packing a sword like that if you aren't even gonna use it? And so I set out on a journey to truly find out what is the point of packing a sword like that if I wasn't even gonna use it? Welcome to DMC4 No Weapons. As always, this challenge was done on Dante Must Die difficulty, the hardest difficulty in the game, and I had several abilities at my disposal. The first and most important ability was the Buster. It did tons of damage, and I was able to use it on human bosses like Dante here, and pretty much any regular enemy as well. The second tool in my kit was the Dropkick. However, unlike its DMC5 counterpart, the Dropkick was extremely niche and pretty much only reserved for bosses that I couldn't outright grab. The third and final tool in my kit was Devil Trigger Explosion. It dealt a decent amount of damage and also gave iframes, so I used it a lot for safety. 90% of the basic enemies were dealt with via the buster grabs. All of the grabs either slammed enemies into the ground or punched them repeatedly, and if there were any grabs that used Blue Rose or the Red Queen, I avoided them at all costs. The reason I didn't dropkick basic enemies was not due to lack of damage. The dropkick actually does a substantial amount of damage, all things considered. In order for the dropkick to come out, you have to be at full sprint. To achieve full sprint, you have to run for quite a while while in combat. Additionally, if you make any sharp turns, you lose your sprint. Beyond that, the drop kick is a moving hitbox according to your speed, and the basic enemies are usually pretty small and relatively mobile, so it became quite the chore just to achieve sprint, and then most of the time I would just straight up miss the enemy anyways. Where the dropkick did shine was against bosses. Typically, the bosses had wide open arenas with plenty of place to run, and there was also another neat little mechanic. I was able to jump to dodge attacks, and if I kept holding the same direction I was already running, I would maintain my sprint or my progress towards sprint. In essence, dodging, but keeping the dropkick. Utilizing the dropkick when I could, and using Devil Trigger Explosion and jumping for iframes and dodging attacks, I was able to defeat Burial in only 9 minutes, and a large part of that was due to the fact that around 4 bars of health left, Burial just decided to lose his flame and let me grab him. By the time it was all said and done, he had lost almost all of his health. I tried grabbing him during the moment where he dashed at me, but I messed up the timing, and I was still able to grab him anyways. And then it was just a few more drop kicks to victory. Moving on to mission 3 was the first encounter with Frost. A pretty agile and dangerous enemy, I learned something very important about these frosty fiends during my no upgrades challenge run. If you try to grab or snatch them on the ground, they will dodge and try to counterattack you. If you grab or snatch them during this counterattack, they won't be able to dodge, and you'll get them guaranteed every time. Another interesting quirk is that when you have one grabbed and there's one or two others around you, they will not attack unless they were already in an attack animation when you started the grab. But essentially, the other frosts pacify while you beat up their friend. So as long as you camera trick one, get the grab on the other, it doesn't matter if that first frost comes on screen afterwards, because he won't touch you. If you were wondering about these wheels that you have to periodically hit throughout the game, the buster arm grab animation is enough to get him spinning, so that was no issue. The Bianco Angelos went down just as easily as the Frosts, because they operate under similar scripting. If you grab one of them and the others were not in the middle of an attack animation, they won't hit you. They'll just watch in terror as you pierce their lance through their friends and probably family, or something. I don't know, they're, they're just sentient, like, 
demon or human souls in armor. It's a whole thing. DMC4 lore is weird. Mission 4 introduced the Blitz. I'll talk more about this enemy the next time we encounter him, but for now, all you need to know is that it's a relatively annoying enemy that's very hard to deal with normally. Thankfully, in this encounter, I had a gyro blade to assist me. I would use the buster arm on it, send it flying towards the creature, and eventually it would destroy the Blitz's armor. Once the armor was gone, I was able to buster it until it died. Unfortunately for me, there are no gyro blades on elevators. More on that later. The beginning of the Bale fight was very interesting. His two feeler things don't actually attack you until the boss himself gets revealed. So I had a lot of issues trying to damage them. The only way I was really able to was with Devil Trigger Explosion. Fortunately, I came to find out that this section wasn't just based on dealing enough damage, but it was also on a timer. So all I really had to do was wait it out. Once he revealed himself, it was back to drop kicking. When he would disappear, that was when I would get my main damage on him because I could buster the feelers because they would actually attack me this time, which meant I could grab them during their attacks and they wouldn't dodge it. Doing bosses so slowly, I came to realize that just about every boss devil triggers at two bars of health left, specifically. They also have specific changes to their AI when this happens. So for Bale here, when he devil triggers, he also stops hiding and summoning his feelers. For me, that meant that I had to deal the last two bars of his health entirely through drop kicks. This fight ended up taking 22 minutes, which was almost three times longer than the burial fight. I think I'm starting to sense a trend with bosses as we go forward. <laughs> And of course, this wouldn't be a Lucid Enigma video or challenge run without defeating the boss with a sliver of health left, or one hit away from death. So, mark that one off your bingo cards. Wanna know what almost killed the run? A chandelier. To finish out mission five, you have to slice the chandelier and break open the wall. Buster didn't work, and I wasn't even sure if I'd be able to get a drop kick off. When I eventually did, however, it seemed like it didn't work. But I tried again, and it didn't work. And then it finally hit. The other attempts just completely missed the trigger. But the dropkick got it done in the end. If you've ever played DMC4, you'll probably remember the dice minigame. But did you know there's a consistent way to get the exact number that you want every time? All you have to do is use the buster arm on the dice, and whatever number is on top at the time you bustered it will be the number that it stops on. So this room caused me no issues. The window boss that followed also wasn't much of an issue because they really want you to use the buster and only the buster for this boss anyways. So all I did was throw swords at the window until it died. But I have a question. Have you ever heard of the tragedy of Darth Plagueis the Wise? When I got to the forest, I didn't feel like dealing with the Mephistos during the platforming section, so I did what I always do. I step on the platforms, trigger them, lure them over to solid ground, and deal with them there. And if you're fast enough, you don't even lose any time, because you can just jump back on the penultimate platforms and make your way to the exit. This was the first encounter against Assault, and their AI works similarly to Frost's and Angelo's in that when you grab them, they will kind of pacify. However, it's a lot more inconsistent than with the other two enemy types. But still, for the purposes of this challenge, I really didn't have any other choice than grabbing them. It did the most damage, it was the easiest way to attack them. Trying to get a drop kick off on these agile beasts was just out of the question. And suddenly it was time for Nero to answer the question, if something laughs in the forest and someone's around to kill it, will they? Before I get into all the little details of the boss, have you ever seen Echidna do this? 
Yeah, me neither. Let's talk details. First of all, she has three different modes, essentially. She has one where she plants herself in the ground and spawns tentacles all over the place. My general way of dealing with this was getting drop kicks on the body. If timed right, the drop kick could also hit her plant-like form that's planted into the ground, which counts as a separate entity and helps deal additional damage. Her second form is when she plants herself in the ground a different way, revealing a purple core that spits out seeds. All this amounts to is a free buster for a lot of damage, and she would do it quite often. Akina would also do an attack which became more and more frequent the lower her health got, where she would charge out of bounds and occasionally occasionally swoop into the arena trying to hit Nero. This was by far the most dangerous attack that she had, not only because I didn't have a way to damage her, but because if I got hit by it, it would hurt a lot. Now I did have a way of dealing with it, but it was a little finicky and it required a lot of concentration and very fast reaction time. Um, Lucid, you said Echidna has three modes, but you only talked about two, and then you started talking about the dash. What's- Um, right, yeah, about that. Her third mode is just her default floating, which on its own seems pretty innocuous, but it actually played a big part in the fight. So as I mentioned with the drop kick, when she plants herself and summons tentacles, you can hit both the plant section and the female section. What that means is you should also be able to hit the plant section with a drop kick when she's just floating around, and she does the hair whip attack or the tail whip. The thing is, her plant section takes reduced damage, so running around for sprint during that time and trying to get one off without getting hit is realistically not worth it at all. So my initial thought was that I just wouldn't be able to damage her when she's floating around, but that all changed when I discovered something very vital to this fight. Did you know that the buster arm does damage? I'm not talking about grab animations, obviously those do damage, but I'm talking about the animation that Nero does when you press the buster grab button at any point. If you watch closely when I use it on Echidna, her health goes down. With this discovery, I was able to safely deal quick hits to her plant section when she was just floating between her grounded phases. Now, while more damage was certainly nice, I could have also just waited for her to do the move that lets me get a buster on her for a lot of damage. I could have just done that for the entire fight, right? Except remember how I mentioned that bosses do different things once they reach two bars of health and devil trigger? The special thing that Echidna does is she removes that move from her script. She no longer will reveal her purple core for you to bust her once she's at two bars of health or below. Plus, she was devil triggered, and she would dash a lot, which meant that my opportunities for damage were greatly reduced. So knowing that I could damage her with Buster after she did a tail whip or hair whip attack while she was floating there was huge knowledge. Because of the removal of this specific move, when she gets low on health, her pattern completely changes. She starts doing three dashes in a row, and then she plants herself and summons tendrils. With the tendril attack alone, I had enough time to maybe get a single drop kick, two if I was lucky. But thankfully, because of the buster arm damage, I was able to do a lot of damage to her in between her dashes because if you get close enough, she usually tries to attack you and get you away from her before she dashes again. Now, when she dashed, I would try to stay towards a wall. The first thing you want to do is run towards and behind her when you see her preparing the dash. Then run to the nearest wall preferably a corner, because if you're in a corner, she will literally never hit you. But if you're against a wall, just make sure you jump to the side and then stand directly against the wall until she's done. If you pull her too close towards the wall before she dashes, and she's right there with you when she starts the dash, there's a high likelihood that she'll hit you, instead of veering up like she normally would. 
Overall, this was definitely the most difficult fight so far. It took me a lot of attempts to figure out her patterns, weaknesses, and when I could realistically deal damage safely to her. But she went down and we were moving on to Credo. Credo is an extremely fun boss, but for the purposes of this challenge, he was very easy. Anytime he whiffed his attacks, you could buster him for decent damage. And eventually when his shield broke, you could get a huge buster that dealt a ton. You could also buster his spears back at him for extra damage. And overall, yeah, no weapons. Credo's still fun, but pretty easy. After getting inside the Order of the Sword, I was met with the Gauntlet. Literally, that's what this area is called. They knew what they were doing. This is a series of three battles that each take place in small elevators with intermittent laser puzzles between elevator transitions, with no checkpoint. The first elevator sees you fight a number of scarecrows and then a couple of mega scarecrows. Nothing too bad, but they can definitely be annoying and take some health off of you that you might not get back. The second elevator after the Scarecrows held four Frosts. Fortunately, they didn't all jump out at once. Two Frosts would spawn, and after you killed one of them, another one would spawn. And with the knowledge of how they pacify after you grab them, that encounter wasn't all too bad. The real party started in the third and final elevator. The last elevator held a number of assaults, which, while somewhat annoying on their own, were not that bad. They would die in a couple of grabs, and they didn't do that much damage. But after you killed the assaults, a blitz came into party. This was the issue. Remember how I said back in Mission 4, there are no gyro blades on elevators? I didn't have anything to assist me against this blitz, and I was trapped in a very tiny room with just him and me. The buster arm did nothing, it would just bounce off of his electric armor, and the drop kick would actively hurt me if I was ever even able to get it off. So all I had at my disposal was Devil Trigger Explosion to break his armor. Once it was broken, I could grab him to death. But until then, it was gonna be a doozy. After numerous attempts of attempting to dodge, use Devil Trigger for damage, and finally break this armor, I got this run. And remember, every time I died to this guy, I had to go start back at floor one fighting those scarecrows again. Welcome to the gauntlet. At the top of the tower was Agnes, and thankfully there was a checkpoint before this boss fight. I tried using the buster arm to damage him like I did with Echidna, but Agnes turned out to have this really fancy kick that he would counterattack with and then celebrate after it hits you. So devil trigger explosion and drop kick, it was. Except Agnes the genius scientist loved to show off his creations, and it just so happened that all of his creations were very, very grabbable. Using his own creations to damage him felt really good. They did pretty substantial damage, they gave Devil Trigger when they were killed, and at one point in the fight, it almost felt like that is how this fight was designed and intended to be played, only using the Buster Arm. Throughout the fight, at certain points, Agnosi would try to get off a large concentrated blast that hit the entire arena, and if it was successful, it would heal the boss and damage me a ton. Fortunately, there were a number of ways to deal with it. Throwing one of his creations at him would immediately break him out of his concentration. Additionally, two to three Devil Trigger explosions would also break him out of it. But if he was Devil Triggered and there were no other enemies out on the field, there was no way I was going to be able to break his concentration. Essentially, he'd be rolling a DC 10 concentration check with a plus 11 to save. Fortunately, whether he was Devil Triggered or I didn't have enough DT of my own, there was always a way out. By using the startup iframes that you get from entering Devil Trigger, I was able to dodge the first part of the attack and then use Table Hopper, Nero's perfect side dodge, to completely avoid the rest of the attack. 
Once the boss lost about four bars of health, he started summoning hellhounds, and these were the main money maker. A grab on one of them would shoot a fireball at Agnes, dealing about the same damage as the flying swords. But when Devil triggered, the hellhound grab would shoot out four, five, or six fireballs. And at a close range, this could easily remove a full bar, if not more, from Agnes's health. So once he started summoning the dogs, that's how I rushed him down. Good boys. After that, I showed Dante what fist tasted like, again. And then, the real fight began. Everything I had done up to this point couldn't even amount to what I was about to do. It was time to fight Sanctus. If you know anything about Sanctus, you might be able to guess where this is going. And if you don't know anything about Sanctus, let me tell you. Sanctus is a very old man, and he lives in a bubble. He was also asked the question of what superpower he would want, and he answered with the ability to float. So he also floats. He has a total of four attacks. A ground cone that electrifies the floor in front of him, one to two ground tremors that home in and track Nero, a rainstorm of lightning centered around Nero, and a number of fireballs directed at Nero's current position. He also has two floating apparatuses that can independently fly off and attack Nero. For movement, Mr. Pope has a dash. He can dash forwards and backwards, but the dash will always move him a specific set amount of distance. This knowledge became very useful. But first, how do you damage this guy? Well, you have to first break his bubble. The only way I was able to do damage to the bubble in this challenge was with Devil Trigger Explosion. It took seven activations of Devil Trigger to break his bubble one time. After that, he would try to run away and attack me to give himself enough time to regenerate his bubble. If I was able to deal enough damage to him with his bubble down, I could knock him down and get a grab on him, which was the only real way I could get any meaningful damage on this guy. The issue was, if he got away even once, I would be unable to knock him down, and I'd have to go through the bubble cycle all over again. So that's where positioning came into play. Because his dashes moved him a set amount, I would position him one dash away from the wall or the back of the arena. If he was fully up against the wall when his bubble broke, he would simply teleport away back to the center of the arena and regenerate his bubble. If he was one dash away from the wall, when his bubble broke, he would dash back once and then do an attack. This was enough distance and enough time for me to close in, hit him with Devil Trigger Explosion, and then hopefully stunlock him enough to get two more activations in, which would allow me to knock him down. It didn't always work, but when it did, the grab took a lot of health off of him. Essentially, the fight was a Devil Trigger farming simulator. I was at no risk of dying so long as I played it safe, dodged his attacks, enemy stepped on his bubble, and used taunts to gain DT effectively. I would do six DT explosions on the bubble, and before the last break, I would get his position in the arena correct, and farm up to full DT to make sure I had enough to knock him down. The fight got even easier once I knocked him down for the third time and got him into second phase. Once his bubble broke in this phase, if you were unable to knock him down in time, instead of just re-upping the bubble, he enters the savior and attempts to punch you. If you parry the punch with the buster arm, it knocks Sanctus out and you can get a free grab on him. So all I had to do was parry the savior three times and Sanctus would be dead. That is, if my timing was good. And I certainly choked a lot. All of these steps may sound simple enough, but this fight was an extreme test of endurance. The total time my successful fight to kill Sanctus took was 1 hour and 33 minutes. One momentary lapse of judgment and I could lose half if not all of my health, and I certainly had to end up table hopping for my life numerous times. This fight, while not inherently very hard, required a lot of attention and a lot of consistency. And let's not forget, you fight this guy again at the very end of the game, and he's even more juiced up. But for now, it was on to Dante.
When it came to no weapons as Dante, Royal Guard was a shoe in I also used Omen because opening a briefcase was hardly a weapon. And there was also the Rose from Lucifer. It was good at stun locking enemies, but it did abysmal damage. I also decided to use Pinup and the Swordmaster moves for Lucifer because they didn't actually swing the weapon and the blades that were thrown out were summon swords, which aren't actual weapons. There was one issue with the moveset I had at my disposal. These spinny things were not affected by any of the moves that I could use. The rose didn't work, pinup didn't work, royal release, nothing. Fortunately, this one was skippable, but there was another one later on that wasn't skippable. Once I escaped the Order of the Sword HQ and made it to the forest, I encountered the first Blitz as Dante. I was able to completely remove its lightning shield with a single use of Omen, but because of the demon that would come up from the ground and try to eat me, it made it very hard to get Omen off due to its large startup and recovery. I eventually ended up staying on this rock where the demon wouldn't spawn and I could easily throw summon swords and use Omen to take out the Blitz. When it came to fighting Echidna, she got completely shredded by the summon blades. I would throw them out and she would fly through them. Then all I had to do was throw the rose and they would explode even when she was flying out of the arena. In the same vein, Dagon didn't put up much of a fight either. The blades were really good at destroying the ice atop his head, which caused him to get stunned and let me get even more swords into him. Seriously, I killed him from half health and he wasn't even really able to move. So if you've ever looked past Lucifer for its awkwardness, maybe give it a second chance. Before I was even able to make it to Dagon though, I had to face a mandatory spinny thing. As we established before, nothing I did was able to activate it, so I used the next closest thing, which was Dimension Cuts with the Yamato in the Dark Slayer style. Technically, he unsheaths the weapon for half a second when doing the Dimension Cut, so I would consider it using the weapon, but there was genuinely no other way around it, to my knowledge. I love challenge runs because they breed innovation. Many people, myself included, hate fighting these fish as Dante. But due to this challenge run and my restrictions, I found a surefire way to deal with them. When one jumps out of the water to attack, simply throw the rose. Then you can take it out however you want afterwards. As long as you time your rose throw, the fish will get knocked out and lay on the ground for you to wail on, even when devil triggered. One rose would do the trick. Similarly to the other demons, Burial also fell under the pressure of Lucifer. When he would do his big explosion, I threw a bunch of swords out and then got close and used the sword master move to command them to teleport and fly into him. Once he lost his flame, it was all over, as I was able to get a ton of swords into him and melt the rest of his HP. While wandering the streets of Fortuna, I met a cuddly little scarecrow. He wasn't hurting anybody, so I just let him be. I named him Max, a short for Maximilian. Me and him had a good laugh about that bug scientist Agnes, and this old man thinking that he was gonna be the new god of the world or something like that. Max was a really cool guy. And would you know it, not too long after I bid Max farewell, I came face to face with that same bug scientist we were laughing about. Funny thing about Agnes, he must have been very hungry, cause I kept laying down summon swords and he kept eating them up. It only took a few attempts, and he did not cause me much trouble at all. All of Dante had pretty much been smooth sailing up until this point, but it was time for the savior. If you're familiar with the fight, you know that typically you have to activate those spinny things to trigger beams or cannons to knock the savior down. I didn't really have a way of activating those spinny things, as we've established throughout the run. What I did have was Royal Guard. Shoutouts to FIFA Dude Master for giving me the tip that Royal releasing the Savior's attacks eventually knocked him down. This was huge and it allowed me to go throughout the arena while he was knocked down and take out all of his crystals. Well, all of them except for one. 
To push the savior into his second phase, you have to take out his forehead crystal as well. But that was unreachable. Pandora did not work because Omen did not have the range. If I climbed up his arm and used Omen, the startup was just too long and he would hit me out of the attack before it would ever go off. I couldn't reach his forehead to Royal Guard or release the gem. I only had one option, Lucifer. By going as close to the top of his arm as possible and using the forward Swordmaster move to summon swords to his forehead, they were just barely able to reach and stab into it. This was the only way that I was able to break his forehead gem. Once I got to the second phase, it was pretty much the same as the first. When he would come close, I threw out a bunch of summon swords, and I used Royal Guard and Royal Release to knock him down quickly. And when I had access to the central crystal, Lucifer actually melted his health. Then, I just had to wait for him to get close one more time, and that was all she wrote. Before the final Sanctus fight, I had to face every boss that I've already fought up to this point as Nero again. Essentially, it was a chance for me to show off all of the knowledge that I had learned, and each subsequent boss went down even easier than the last. Then it was just the holy man himself. Fortunately, I had already spent many an hour with good old Saint Sanctus in Mission 11, but there were a couple things to note for this fight. One was that at half health, he didn't have a nice big statue that I could knock him out of for a free grab. Two, his bubble had slightly less health, so it only took six Devil Trigger explosions to break. And the third thing was that his pattern was pretty different. Most of the time when staying away, he would do his ground tremors, which I never wanted to table hopper because the risk versus reward was simply not worth it. They did way too much damage. However, he would always follow up his lightning storm attack with fireballs. And the way to trigger his lightning storm was to get close to him. I usually did it by just enemy stepping on his bubble. Initially, I thought it was impossible to break Sanctus's guard after the bubble broke and get a grab on him, but that turned out not to be the case. The reason I thought it was impossible was because when you attack him sometimes, he blocks with Sparta. So I thought that he would just negate my Devil Trigger explosion. What actually happened is he would still take the stagger damage, even though he blocked. So as you can see, he blocked my second Devil Trigger explosion, but when I got the third one on him, he still fell down, meaning that he took the stagger damage of the second attack, even though he blocked it. In some cases, him blocking my Devil Trigger explosion actually helped me, because he would sit there for long enough that I could leave Devil Trigger and get another Devil Trigger explosion guaranteed. But don't let the edits fool you, the health bar may look like it's gone down fast, but it hasn't. This was still very much an endurance test like the first Sanctus fight. It was a lot of getting hit, dodging, healing up, getting more DT to break his bubble, and repeating the cycle. This is the footage played at 400% speed, and this is just him at his last sliver of health during one bubble break. I did this for two hours and 20 minutes. That's how long this fight took. I'll show the end screen in a minute, and it will say two hours and 43 minutes, but that's because I was playing on turbo mode and the in-game timer counts down faster thanks to turbo. But finally, I got the last grab, Sanctus was done, and so was the no weapons challenge. Thank you all so much for watching. I did this run to pay homage to my Devil May Cry 5 weaponless run. I hope this run was just as entertaining and crazy to watch as that one. And thank you all for the support. Thank you for watching. Take care everyone and have a wonderful day.